Hey, hello. Um, okay, so as usual, I'll start by saying here we are in the book. Almost the same as last time. Um, And the transcendental dialectic. Um, and then the second part of the dialectical sequence of the theory. Um, yeah. Oh. Three dialectical inferences, or three types of dialectical inferences, and now we're on the second one. Um, um. So, uh, right, so what's going on here in general, remember, is that um, um, reason uh, demands a unified explanation for each judgment. And it demands three different types of explanation corresponding to the three different types of syllogism. Right? The three types of syllogism are the same as the three relations of judgments. Because the syllogism. Are classified according to the relation in the major premise. Um, and uh, um, the dialectical illusion is that we look for a guarantee that there will be a complete explanation at each time. We look for that guarantee in the object. So here we're looking for an unconditional internal explanation. Here we're looking for an unconditional external explanation. Um, and Yeah, as usual, it's hard to write up what's going on in the disjunctive case in, in any succinct way, but uh, um, we're looking for an internal explanation of why all the external explanations are as they are and not some other way. So, like, Maybe to make this clearer and to make clear the difference between these two parts of the dialectic, um, you can think of like traditional, like rationalist or even Aristotelian proofs of the existence of a first cause of the world. So, like, so you, I mean, you start with something like. Okay, something happened at time t. And then you say, well, you know, there must be an explanation why this happened. So the explanation is the cause that happened at some prior time. And there's an explanation for that. And there's an explanation for that. And you ask for an unconditioned explanation of all the explanations. Um, and either someone might tell you, well, there's a first uncaused cause in this series, or someone might tell you there's no first member of this series. So every member of this series has an explanation. 
in terms of the previous one, right? And then if you add them all up, that's an unconditioned explanation. But now, I mean, so like those two things are the third antinomy, right? Like those two alternatives are the third antinomy, which is um, which is the main part of the reading for today. Uh, I'm not sure if it's in the main part, but anyway, it was part of the reading for today was the third antinomy. Um, they, they, you know, they appear to contradict each other or whatever. It's not just going to say there's something wrong with both of them in the end. But suppose you accept one of those explanations, right? So suppose you say, like, okay, yeah, this has a complete explanation because nothing else could have happened in view of this infinite series of prior causes. That would be accepting the antithesis of the, of the third antinomy. Um, so then someone might ask, okay, but why was it this series rather than some other infinite series? Right, and I mean, like, um, Historically, that's the response to that answer when you like when you're trying to like I think Leibniz says this in more or less explicitly these terms, right? When you're when you're trying to prove that there has to be a first cause, and someone says, "Well, look, there doesn't have to be a first cause because there could be an infinite series of prior causes," then Leibniz will say, "Okay, sure, in a sense, that's a complete explanation of why this happened, but you still haven't told me why it's this series." There could have been some completely different series, and which would have a different result at the end. So um, that's asking for a different kind of explanation, right? And that corresponds to the different kinds of explanations that Kant is talking about in these two parts. Right here, he's talking about an explanation of something in the world in terms of its conditions in the world. And reason is asking for an unconditioned version of that. But here, as he puts it, and now I think based on what I just said, you can understand why it comes out this way. He says, here we're talking about, um, we're comparing a thing not to the other things in the world, but to the totality of possible things. Right, so that's what was happening in that second step when Leibniz said, okay, fine, maybe this is a complete explanation of why this happened, but in another sense, it's still completely unexplained. And, you know, the explanation we arrive at here is supposed to be somehow in the world or part of the world or some, or is the whole world or something like that. Whereas the explanation we arrive at here can't be that, right? Like anything that's part of the world can't be the explanation why this world exists rather than some other world. Okay, so I mean, um, so in the antinomy, we're talking about this part. We're talking in the antinomy, we're talking about the relationship between um, uh, phenomena in the world. Um. And like, why is that connected to the hypothetical syllogism and the external explanation, right? Because that's, you know, um, the hypothetical syllogism is, Right, so like this event here is A and B. And we're looking for an explanation that is about something else. <laughs> um, so like this. Um, 
So that's the way different phenomena are related to each other. Um, I think that's easier to understand than something I talked about for a while last time but couldn't really resolve, namely why this stuff is about the soul. Right? Like to understand why this why why this explanation is an explanation of the world and of something in the world in terms of something else in the world. Um um, I guess maybe it's also a little bit hard to understand why it's about that specific thing. What's to say that this condition is the same kind of this condition at all? What, couldn't it be a completely different kind of condition? That That is going to turn out to be part of the solution to the dynamical in, uh, antinomies. Um, that you can think this condition as, not, as, as super sensible. You can think of this condition as not one of the series of events. Um, but, uh, uh, but I guess the way to put it is like from a more positive point of view, like this is this is the kind of explanation that the understanding um, actually finds by looking at the relationship between different things that happen in the world, external dependence. So uh, um, there's no need for it. In, there's, there, seems, there, there seems to be or is no need for it in response to the demand of reason to go looking at something that's not part of the series. Yeah. So would you say earlier talk about the different, different series? Or like how the world is different set of those lines. Yeah. Like it's a form of logic or a different like not solution, or it's like a different mode of something that makes sense. Uh I'm not sure which what thing I said you're referring to, but um like instead instead of there being like a user bias that's the reason that like it's this series of events and not another series of events. Oh, right. Yeah. So I'm saying that that, I think, Klaus is, is associating that kind of explanation with the disjunctive syllogism. Right. So the disjunctive syllogism says about, like, um, what is the case that it has to be either this or this or this? And it's not this and it's not this, so it must be this. And now, if you imagine that you could, like, this is divided into every possible way that things could be. Um, and then, you know, you would look for a ground for one of them being chosen over the others. Um, that's, I mean, uh, uh, you know, according to Leibniz, that ground is the goodness of the divine will, right, which ensures that the one is chosen is the best possible. Um, um, but uh, the argument Kant is talking about in the ideal is just the argument up to the point that there must be some ground like that. Well, no, maybe I shouldn't say that. And then the syllogism is not nothing to do with the ground. The... I mean, you know, maybe I should talk about this more when we get to the idea. I think I'm going to get myself confused if I start talking about it now. But I mean, the, the disjunctive syllogism looks like
Right, but this is what a defensive syllogism looks like in general. So, um, um, so we should think of E is F as like the description of what world there is. And C is D as another way to world to be. Um, um, So when you conclude that C is not D, you're still left asking, well, okay, why is it C D? And then you can give another disjunctive syllogism to explain that. And as usual, if you go back in those series of disjunctive syllogisms, you're just going to get one after another. You're never going to get anything different. Right? But um, um, so like the logical series is a series. It, doesn't have a particular way of stopping and reason doesn't really ask for it to stop. But when we say, oh, but there must be something in the way things are that unconditionally explains why it's this and not anything else. Um, so that thing is not gonna be a part of the description of the way the world is, right? It's not gonna be E with that. Going to be something else. Um, uh, and it did like, so the idea that it's going to be God, right? This part is about transcendental theology. Is, uh, am I answering your question or not? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. All right. So, but anyway, I'm going to go back and talk about hypnotinomy, which is actually what we're dealing with. Um, so, um, So what that means is that the antinomy, as opposed to the paralogism or the ideal, it's a kind of weird situation because we're looking for an explanation in the world, but we're looking for a kind of explanation that couldn't actually be encountered in the world. Um, it's, it, this is the way Kant puts it. This is B447. It's on page 393 in the translation. Um, thus, despite the objection that these ideas are one and all transcendent, and although they do not in kind surpass the object, they do not in kind surpass the object, namely appearances, but are concerned exclusively with the world of sense, not with noumena, they yet carry the synthesis to a degree which transcends all possible experience. Actually, I mean, Maybe I shouldn't have read the objection. Kant is responding here to an objection or is imagining an objection. Why call these cosmological ideas, right? Why say this is about cosmology and call the ideas cosmological? And the objection is that these ideas are one and all transcendent. Although they do not in kind surpass the object, namely appearances, that are concerned exclusively with the world of sense, not with noumena, they yet carry the synthesis to a degree which transcends all possible experience. So they so as opposed to right in the paralogisms, the the soul regarded as a purely intellectual substance or whatever is different in kind from the events in the world. Um, and similarly here in the ideal, God is going to be different in kind from the world that we're using God to explain. But here, the explanation we're going to give is not different in kind from the thing we're explaining, right? So like we're trying to explain this event in terms of other events just like it. Um, but it's different in degree from any synthesis that actually occurs in experience because um, it's finished. It's unconditional. Um, it's, well, I mean, there's two things about it. One is that it's total. It contains, um, 
all the plurality of conditions added up. And the other is that reason says, since it's total, it has, can't have any conditions outside of itself, so it must provide an unconditioned explanation. But um, we never experience an absolute totality. Right, remember, that was what I said like, like way a long time ago when I was talking about singular judgments, right? That an example of a singular judgment is this cinnabar weighs five grams. So uh, I'm taking some of the plurality, some of the self-difference of cinnabar, going through it, and then adding it up into a new unit. But, and that's a totality. And that's why these singular judgments depend on or um, use the function of the understanding, which is, of, which is a category of totality. But this totality is never an absolute totality, right? It's always this cinnabar weighs five grams. We don't reach um, singular judgments about cinnabar. Um, if you yeah. take all cinnabar in the world, would that be an absolute judgment? Right, but we, but but we don't. But there is no such object of experience that's all cinnabar in the world. Um, and uh, it's not just at least according to Kant. Um, it's not just like there is no such object of experience as um, um, as a two ton piece of gold. But they could be, you know, <laughs> that they just we haven't experienced it. But we couldn't experience all the cinnabar in the world. Because experience is always conditioned, right? Like we never in, in multiple different ways. And one way is that like the plurality of experience is never finished being added up. So, um, so we never have an absolute totality. So that's why when um, reason demands an absolute totality, it's demanding something that's in kind like the objects of experience, but in degree infinitely more. Or, I mean, it's not so much that it's it's too big. I mean, but that it's yeah, that it's finished, that it's all added up, right? So both sides of the antinomy are going to be bad. One of them is too short. Um, it's you know what we never experience. What we can never experience is this event that has no cause. Um, one of them is too long. We can never experience enough events to add them all up to an infinite series of events. But um, but really, it's the same problem in both cases, right? That it's just like two different ways of noticing that we can't experience an absolute totality. Um, okay, and so, I mean, um, so, like, I think that is, because of what I just said, that's basically why the antinomy is an antinomy. What? <laughs> What is an antinomy? Um, so, right, as we probably know, namos means law in Greek. Um, so an antinomy is a contradiction in the law.
in the analogy Kant is making here, um, um, is he says that um, if the law contains a contradictory principle, um, then that can be discovered. I'm not sure if he means this is the only way it can be discovered or the best way it can be discovered. But anyway, it can be discovered when you find that a judge can argue the same case either way. <laughs> um, um, and they can argue the same case either way have to be like this in the legal context. I don't know, but what we're thinking is they can argue the same case either way by contradiction. That is, right, so the way this works is you say, like, okay, is the verdict A or not A? Maybe I shouldn't use the So I say, like, okay, assume it's P, argue, 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 and I get a contradiction. So the conclusion is the verdict must be not P. That's a proof by contradiction. So, I mean, so far, this is fine. Nothing in particular has gone wrong here. The problem is if you can also do this. You assume it's not true, then you also get a contradiction. Right, because I mean, when you only had one of these, you weren't actually believing the contradiction, right? You were just using it to rule this out. But now you prove the contradiction. <laughs> um, so, um, like, um, this is what I'm worried about. This is certainly a typical way of proving contradictions, right? Like the Russell paradox. Not by coincidence. I think the Russell paradox is uh, in Russell's own mind, a descendant of Kant's antinomies. You say something, you say, um, Let R be the set of all sets that are not members of themselves. So, uh, and then you ask, is R a member of itself? So, assume it is. Then, since R is a member of itself, R is a member of sets that are not members of sorry, sets that are not members of themselves. Therefore, R is not a member of itself. Contradiction, right? Because we assume that it is, and we thought that it's not. Then you do it the other way. Okay. Assume not. R is not a member of the set of all sets that are members that are not members of themselves. Therefore, R is a member of itself. Contradiction, and now you prove the contradiction. Right. So, like, um, what? Well, uh, it means something went wrong with the premises, but like, it may not be easy to see what, as in that example, right? That was like Russell basically sent Frege a letter with that example, and Frege was like, "Oh crap, what do I do now?" <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
you know, like in that case, it seems like there must be something wrong with defining a set this way. But what's wrong? That's not so clear. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, it's it's true. That's why you know, like this is a way of finding out there's something wrong in your law. Um, um, so, right, I mean, this method could also be called, and Todd calls it this too, the skeptical method. This is the way the ancient skeptics, it's also actually the way Descartes works in the first meditation. Right, but um, the way the ancient skeptics tried to establish skepticism is they would always look for um, one argument so showing that one side of the one, you know, that they'd always look for an arg one argument showing that B is absurd and another argument showing that not B is absurd. And then the conclusion was you should suspend your judgment. Right, that's the way ancient skepticism worked. So, I mean, uh, that's really the way the first meditation also works, that, that Descartes finds, you know, contradictions in his old beliefs. It's just that his conclusion isn't you should spend your judgment, but that um, we need to look for a new ground of certainty, whatever, right? Um, but so, um, so this, I think, actually, this, I think, is Kant's official term for the procedure that he goes through in the antinomies. That is, it's what some people mean when they say dialectic. Right? When they talk about the dialectic or the dialectical method or something like that. So it's not what Kant means when he says dialectic, right? Because this whole thing is called the dialectic. But, but these contradictions are only in this part. Um, but I think this is this this is what he does call it. It's the skeptical method, and he says, you know, um, it's necessary. In, well, I mean, first of all, he says a couple things about it. Um, um He says it's necessary here because you can't directly show that um, reason has led us into an error. Um, because we can't check it against experience because the conclusion is transcendent. Um, On the face of it, that doesn't seem to be a very good explanation because what about these two parts where we detect the error without using this method, even though we can't check those against experience either? Um, but I guess the idea is, again, like the heart of the matter is that in the antinomy, we're trying to reach a conclusion about the object of experience. So it's not different in kind from an empirical generalization. Um, only it's different in degree in that it can't ever be checked against experience, right? So like if I just say this prior series of causes is infinite, um, There's no amount of experience you can have that can show I'm right. 
Um, and similarly, if I say it's not infinite, there was a first one. Well, all your experience will ever do is lead you to another one that's not the first one. But you can never tell that there isn't a first one somewhere <laughs> from experience. Um, so, uh, so you can't check. So it's like you should be able to check from experience by experience, but you can't. So how can you check it? And the only way you can check it is by saying, well, um, um, it couldn't be right because there's a contradiction. Um, so, um, so that's why the, um, that's why this method is necessary here, but at the same time, it's why this method will always work here, because, um, there is always a contradiction in taking the object of experience to be unconditioned an absolute totality. So, right, whereas in these two, well, at least you can see why it, why it wouldn't work because there is no contradiction, right? Like, um, there's nothing in about, about experience that will ever contradict the assumption that there's an immaterial, purely intelligible being. Um, so, uh, um, so you won't be able to get a, a, a contradiction in these cases. Um, but on the other hand, in these cases, you don't need a contradiction because all you do is point out that we're talking about a type of object that we can't, that we have no cognition of. Right? Because we are talking about something that's different in time from the object of experience. And we can only use the categories to refer to something that's like the object of experience. Yeah. So, um, okay. So that's what's going on here. Um, my question is, should I talk about this or should I talk about this? Right, I have to talk about this. Well, this all right. Um, so, um, I figure out how to segue to this thing. So, the um, there's something confusing about this, though. That, I mean, I think somehow for the same reason as what I was just talking about, but I find it so confusing to me. Um, that, okay, so there, so remember, I said before that in general, that, um, um, the series uh, of pro syllogisms right so we're trying to explain our judgment by a series of syllogisms and um We're looking for a guarantee in the subject of the judgment. That it will always be possible to finish this series. 
But in general, the, the like the guarantee we're looking for isn't going to itself be a series. Right? So like when we tried to guarantee that there was an absolute that the series of categorical syllogisms um, could be, you know, could all be filled in. And we did it in terms of a single thing, the soul. So maybe I just, I think, you know, this, this is phenomenal, right? But then there's something else, the soul. Um, and the soul is the absolute inner explanation of all of these. So because there's an absolute inner ex explanation, we're guaranteed that somehow or other this can be filled in. Um, so the point is like um, that in the paralogism itself, there's no series of syllogisms, um, nor is there any series in the object. Right? You just say there's just one in. Whatever cannot be thought of as subject must be must exist as substance, but the thinking thing cannot be thought of except as subject. Therefore, right? There's that one instance, and then then there's one thing to be placed in relationship to all the phenomena. And similarly, in the case of the ideal, so like when it comes to the anti, so I mean, so first of all, so this is already kind of confusing because it's like. You might think that we were if we would try to guarantee finishing out this series by, by putting some finished series down here. But in the case of the paralysism and the ideal, that's not what we do. Right? It's just one step from all of the things that need to be explained to their unconditional explanation. That will guarantee that this that this series, you know, uh, is all filled in as I keep putting it. But um but it doesn't guarantee it. Like we don't actually go back and find an unconditioned thing at the beginning or anything like that. Um, but in the case of the antinomies, it's more confusing because um, there actually is a series in the object that we're talking about. It's not the same as this series of syllogisms. But it's related to this series of syllogisms. Um, uh, it could be used to fill it in. Um, however, I think. It's still important to realize that um, the, the dialectical inference itself doesn't consist in going back through these syllogisms or back through this series, right? We never talk about the individual members of this series. Um, it's only about the unconditioned totality of this series. And so it's really just one step again from the fact that something happened to the unconditioned totality of its of the series of its conditions. So I mean, uh, Kant actually does write this in the form of a syllogism. I was looking for this last week and I couldn't find it, but um, it's not in today's reading. Uh, I'm not sure if this section is, is in the reading at all or not, but if it is, it's for next time. So it's B525, and it's page 443 in the translation. There's an actual syllogism. The whole antinomy of pure reason rests upon the dialectical argument. If the condition is given, the entire series of all its conditions is likewise given. Objects of the senses are given as conditioned, therefore, etc. So it's a hypothetical syllogism, but it's just one hypothetical syllogism. And it's not like these, it's going the other direction. 
right? Because it's saying, you know, If A is B, then there's the unconditioned totality of the series and of its conditions. <laughs> but A is B, therefore, et cetera, is constant, right? That is, therefore, the unconditioned totality in the series of its conditions is given. And it doesn't matter what A is B is, right? Anything that happens. Just take any, right? Because the way Kant writes the syllogism, the, the minor premise is objects of the senses are given as conditions. Right? So just like anything about the world that's conditioned and therefore needs this type of explanation, the inference is that the, the unconditioned totality in the series of its conditions must be given. What does he mean by given here? Not obviously given to the senses because it's super sensible, right? But it means um, it must be given as the object of cognition. And I mean, precisely the problem is that without an intellectual intuition, that's impossible, right? It could be given. But nevertheless, the dialectical illusion leads us to conclude that it must be, and that therefore we must have an intellectual intuition of it. Um, so uh, there must be an object that the, that idea refers to. Um, and somehow we know that, even though the object doesn't affect our senses. Um, now, I mean, as I said last time, I think it's a little, it seems like it can't be a coincidence that this is a hypothetical syllogism, whereas the syllogism in the paralogy loop is a categorical syllogism. It seems like it can't be a coincidence but it can't be explained that easily either, because again, it's not one of these syllogisms, right? Like these are the hypothetical syllogisms that say, you know, if C is B, then A is B, but C is B, therefore A is B. That's what direction these syllogisms go. Um, this is going the other way. It's not a member of this series. It's not taking you back to the series step by step. It's not even really about this series of syllogisms. It's about the series of conditions of the event down here. But again, not individually. It's only reaching one conclusion about them, namely that um, our idea of an objective, an idea of an absolute totality of them has objective reality. We're thinking about some object when we think about it. That's the conclusion. So why, just because these are hypothetical syllogisms, is this a hypothetical syllogism? Like I said, it seems like it can't be a coincidence, but I don't know how to answer that. Uh, uh, it would be nice if we, if Kant gave an example of a disjunctive syllogism in the ideal, but there are no examples of syllogisms in the ideal. So uh, we don't have that piece of data. Um, okay, what I can say about this though, I think is, um, I think I can say something that Kant doesn't say explicitly and even kind of tries to, I don't know, downplay or something, which is, Okay, so this is how this is going to work.
the three ideas, the three transcendental ideas. Um, corresponds to the three columns in my version of the table of categories. And again, someone, I think so, someone on the first midterm was like, didn't realize that this was just my version <laughs> and thought that Todd gave this version somewhere or something, but he does, Todd always writes in, in that weird diamond thing. <laughs> but anyway, so like the three ideas correspond to this, I mean, if nothing else, you can see that they must because they're classified by the three relations of judgment, categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Um, but, um, but then, as I also said in the first lecture about the dialectic, um, the um, ideas don't apply directly um, I mean, because again, what's really going on here is that reason is telling the understanding to look for explanations for judgments. It's not about concepts and their objects at all. But now under this illusion, we're thinking that this idea has to pick out an object. But it's not really in itself the concept of an object. So when reason says, find me an object that corresponds to this idea, the understanding has to use regular old concepts. But which regular old concepts? Well, it can't use empirical concepts because we're being asked for something super empirical, right? So what concepts can it use? And the only ones are the pure concepts of the understanding. That is the categories, right? So like, so, so the way um, the, at, at, at least in the case of the paralogism, the paralogisms and the antinomy, um, this is fairly explicit. The way the dialectical inferences happen is that you go through each category and the understanding tries to use the category to think the object that the re that reason is demanding. But this, and this is the part that Kant doesn't say explicitly, but that it, again, at least from the paralogisms and the antinomy, it seems clear that um, the categories that the understanding is going to use are the categories in the corresponding column. Right, so like in the case of the paralogism, we started with the soul as substance. This is a little weird. Like why this belongs to quality. But at least we'll see that it's consistent because in the antinomy, the second antinomy is the antinomy of division. So, uh, like, instead of um, reality and negation, we have simplicity and division. Um, but up here we have unity, and then down here, remember the fourth paralogism was something, or the, the fourth, like, heading in the paralogisms was um, the soul is in relation to possible objects in space. So I think we're using the category of possibility there. Um, but I'm going to try to explain that better. But um, so in this case, Kant, there's a section where Kant says, you know, but not every category is usable for this purpose. And then, but then he like goes through and just says, like, gives specific arguments in each case why a certain category is the right one to go with. Again, taking like division as, as if division were a moment of the category of quality. <laughs> like that's the way he talks when he goes through this, right? So like he says, for example, he says, well, there's no series in 
the relationship of substance to action. So this is no good. You can't use this. And there's no series in community. It's there are different parts of the community of substances are coordinated with each other. So which category is left? We must must be causing effects. And he says something like that for each one, but he never says like, well, I mean, he doesn't even have a general name for what I'm calling the second column. Right? Like he couldn't say it, basically. <laughs> but anyway, you know, he doesn't say, and in each case, we get the second column category. Like he doesn't make a generalization, but that is what happens, I think. So like in this case, we're basically talking about the category of plurality. In this case, division, that is negation, somehow. In this case, cause and effect. And in this case, um, existence and non-existence. That is a contingency. It could be or it could not be. Um, um, and um, so these, these categories, I mean, it's not by accident that these categories are the ones that have series. <laughs> these categories are about like externality or self difference, right? Whereas these are about like simple immediate unity. And these are supposed to be some kind of combination of this with that. So, um, Um, so when we look for an absolute external explanation, these are the categories we want. Because these are the categories of externality. Um, and like, and that's also why there's a series in each of these cases, because externality leads to a series. Right? You don't stay with the same thing, but rather you go to something else. Um, then, you know, when reason demands totality in the series, that brings in the third column category. which I think is confusing and leads to even more confusing when we make the transition to the ideal. Um, and again, especially because there's these lists of four things corresponding to the, to the um, four rows here, or the four headings of the categories of Catholicism. There's lists like this in the paralogisms and the antinomy, but there's no list at all in the ideal. I mean, there is one place where he talks about transcendental predicates that we use to describe God, but it doesn't have exactly four, and it's not clear how to line it up with this. So, um, um, but anyway, like, So in each case, we're asking for absolute totality. So like, I mean, in a sense, all of these are categories of totality. Um, that's also why, like when I wrote the, 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 um, the vertical transcendentals up here, right? in section 12, Todd says the transcendental goodness or perfection is about qualitative totality. Um, and um, the reason each of the headings of the categories have a third moment is because every concept, subjectively speaking, has to be a qualitative totality. 
So, so these are all basically categories of totality, but like when we're just talking about plurality, um, simply put, then this is just totality, simply put. And so, like the first antinomy, which is the antinomy of the um, um, infinity of space and time, or really, at least the infinity of the world in space and time. Um, what we ask for is like literally a complete like counting up of the conditions that lead to our to the sensible given event. So I mean in time that's pretty clear, right? We're asking for the previous times. We're asking for a complete measurement, so to speak, like a number of how much of the time that the world has existed up into you know up to this event. Um, and then the only question, the antinomy is whether this is a finite number or an infinite number, <laughs> basically. Whether uh, it's you know, after choosing a unit, if you could measure it out to the end. Or whether no matter what unit you choose, you couldn't measure it out. Um, in the case of space, it's a little bit more confusing. It's also like it's a little weird that that one time the antinomy splits into two antinomies. Um, but basically, Todd says that somehow the series of conditions in the case of space. Are like the limiting of like the definition of a space has to do with the space that limits it, right? So if you ask which space you're talking about, the only way you can answer is by saying what other spaces are around it. That's its place. That's where it is, right? It's inside this space. So the series of conditions in this case is like larger and larger spaces that establish the limits within, right? Because then I ask, oh, well, where's this space? And you give me a bigger space and so forth. And so the antinomy there is whether um, you can count up this whole series or, or how you can, whether it's by an infinite number or a finite number. Um, but in the case of the other categories, so um, like um, so what goes in the table of categories here is limits, community, and necessity. Um, like the second antinomy the two sides of it are either um, matter be, can, can be divided into pieces that are not themselves matter and, and are simple, or matter can be, um, there, is no, there is nothing simple in matter. Any piece of it, any part of it can always be divided into smaller parts. Um, so I mean, either way, we're looking for uh, I mean, obviously, like to understand why that is the antinomy. We have to understand what the relation is between reality and simplicity, or division and negation. But um, but I guess I mean right. So like here, the question is: Can this plurality be reduced to a unity? Can it be contained in a new unity? Here, the question is. Um, um, can this division be reduced to simplicity? 
can it be, so to speak, contained? But now we're not talking about being containing, meaning being inside. We're talking about containing, meaning being conditioned by in the way the parts condition the whole. Um, right? So, like, the whole only exists if its parts exist. I mean, I don't understand. <laughs> but in any case, so like we're looking for uh, uh, um, a division that's done <laughs> and Every whole can be explained in terms of the parts that are reached by that finished division. That's what we have to be able to, to um, treat as one unconditioned condition, right? And again, but again, the question is like, uh, is that a finite division or an infinite division? Um, kind of question it is I mean well it's definitely the same type of question I'm trying I mean what I'm trying to do but this like this is the hardest one maybe although this has this has some problems too but I mean this is the hardest one because again, like where we expect him to talk about reality in negation, instead he talks about simplicity and division. So, um, and says some things that might help explain that, but I still, I still don't feel like I really, um, I still don't feel like I really understand why that happens here. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, I was trying to explain the, the specific relation, like the way the other two categories come in to trying to think the unconditioned in this series. In this case, it's pretty easy to understand, right? Like we look for an unconditioned plurality. That means we're looking for a plurality that uh, is done and we can treat it as a unit. It's like all measured up and finished. And that means we're looking for a plurality that can be reduced to an absolute totality where there's no more plurality left outside of it. Um, and that like fits very well with the with what the antinomy is about and how the arguments go and so forth. But in this case, it's much harder to explain. Um, and maybe I shouldn't have tried, but anyway. Um, okay, I mean, there's probably a lot more I could say about that, but what was I going to say here? All right, what ableist? I guess it is. Mm -hmm. Well, uh. Okay. Yeah, I'm, so I'm just gonna, there's a lot more I could say about this in general. I'm trying to explain what's going on here, um, but, um, but I wanna focus on the third antinomy now. So like, I mean, the reason similar to, to what happened in the, um, um, analogies, the analogies of experience, where uh, it was too long to read all of them. <laughs> and so I selected the second analogy, which the second analogy is about cause and effect. 
um, uh, right? It's the second analogy, but the third antinomy. Why? Because in the analogy, we're going this way, whereas in the antinomy, we're going this way. So the second analogy is about cause and effect, but it's the third antinomy. So, um, so that's why, uh, so it's similar reasons I decided that the third antinomy was the one to read, even though there's certain things that are a little confusing about it, but it's really important because it's, you know, on the one hand connects to the issue of cause and effect, which is the main issue between Kant and Hume. Um, uh, but on the other hand, it's also um, related to the possibility of freedom. Um, so in some sense, it's the most important uh, antinomy. Um, so, I mean, in this case, the totality we're looking for I'm wondering, how can this be described as a kind of community? Um, I'm not sure. Let's <laughs> let me leave that aside and just say the total for the totality we're looking for, we I mean, it's so to speak the same series we're talking about in the first antinomy, in the antinomy of time, right? Because in the infinity of time, we're talking about all the events that precede this event. And all the events that precede this event condition it in the sense that this one can't happen until they're all done. Right? So, like, these all have to happen before this one happens. Um, so, um, um, and, you know, I mean, the reason for the antinomy in a nutshell is that if there's an infinite number of events, they'll never all happen. So we'll never get to the one that we have. There's an infinite series. But on the other hand, a first event is um, uh, first event is a supposed object of experience that could never be experienced. Right. So, like, um, in the uh, I think I shouldn't have really seen it like this. I was just saying it's the same series of events. It's the same series of events, but we're thinking about them differently now. So how are we thinking about them? Well, we're thinking about causes and effects, but like you have to remember that the cause is always a subject. Right? Kant said that in the second analogy. Whereas the effect is always an event. So, like when Kant in the second analogy says, you know, whatever happens must have a cause. Um, what that what that immediately means is what whatever happens must be explained by a substance, and the substance is permanent, right? So, like again, in the case of the boats going down the stream, the cause is the earth. And the Earth is causing an acceleration, right? These boats are accelerating towards the center of the Earth. Um, then there's other forces that balance that out and whatever. But that's basically, that's the cause and effect that's going on here, right? So the acceleration is an event, or I mean, it's like a continuous event. As Kant says, all events really are continuous, right? This event, even though I'm drawing it this way as a one-time thing, um, uh, uh, in mundo non datur saltus, whatever, it, like those things, those Latin things he quotes, like there, there never actually is a jump from one state to another. So yeah, so the acceleration of a continuous event is a change from one state of, state of motion to another state of motion. Um, so, like, so, like, here's the cause. I mean, maybe I shouldn't even draw this here because 
Remember, a substance, this was the this is what you proved in the first analogy. You didn't read it, but I mean you know what it says that substance is permanent. So this cause has always been on the scene. Now, I mean, you might say, wait, are you saying that Earth has always existed? Well, no, I mean, the way the first analogy, like, the way the conclusion of the first analogy is put is that um, the quantum of substance in existence doesn't change. Right? So, like, um, mass is conserved, basically. I mean, he doesn't put it that way. Mass is conserved because mass is conserved is an empirical law. It requires the concept of matter, which is an empirical concept and, and so forth, right? But this is the transcendental version of the conservation of mass. We're using only transcendental concepts and we just say the quantum of substance in existence doesn't vary, right? So like, even if the earth splits up someday, um, the substance that caused that change is still there. It's just spread out now. And if you ask, like, okay, does that, do you mean it's made of little tiny permanent substances that are like Leibniz's monads and they just rearrange themselves or that are like atoms or something like that? Or do you mean like um, substance in general is something that's spread out in space and it can always be further divided. Well, that's the, that's the second antinomy, <laughs> right? That is, there is no answer to that question. You can't really think of it either way. But so in any case, that was all to explain why I'm saying that this, this cause is always here. And this cause, so therefore it preceded the event in time, that's good. And it determined it to exist. But the question now is, hold on a second, why didn't it cause it to exist way back here? The cause was already there. So the answer is, as Kant puts it, that the causality of the cause is itself an event. That is, this cause was always here, but something happened to make it start causing this, which it didn't before. What do you mean? This causality of that was another cause. What's the causality? Right, that's the series. <laughs> okay. That's the series, right? So, so you say, okay, so so like this cause is able to cause this event, but only when it's in a certain state. So it's being that certain state is like, it wasn't in that state before. That's why it didn't cause this effect. This causality. This is the effect. And this is the cause. So, like, I mean, it's hard to say how to how to how to put that in terms of this example. I mean, if the boat was on the water. Maybe. Yeah, I guess, except the boat is still accelerating towards the center of the earth, even when it's not on the water, right? Like, I mean, and in fact, if you just took the water away, the boat would accelerate directly towards the center of the earth. <laughs> right. So, I mean. Um, it's a little, I mean, but you know, you could think of uh, something like before the earth was born, you know, when the earth was still split up into pieces, did they have this effect? I mean, I guess you have to be careful. What do you mean by this effect? Of course, even when it's split up into pieces, it's still going to attract everything towards its center of gravity. But, but anyway, so, um, so, uh, so I don't know exactly how to apply to this example, but it, I mean, which I think is a little bit worrying actually, because this is the real kind of example. But 
in any case, this is like just going back to the abstract way of talk, talking about it. So, like, the cause has this effect, but only when it's in a certain state. And it has to be like for the, the effect to come into existence, it, the cause has to go into that state. And now you say, so like this is, I mean, you could call this. So like this, this event, yeah, I should be able to draw two different substances here. We call them A and C. So this event is a change in the state of substance A. It's gone from its previous state to some other state called B. It happens when some other substance C was previously went into the state B. So, right, that's our hypothetical judgment. Right, this is, this is the effect. And this is the cause. And this is the causality of the cause. And this is, I don't know what to call it, the subject of the effect, the thing the effect happens to, I suppose, right? So, um, um, and then, yeah, so sure enough, as you were saying, hold on a second, wait, don't we need to explain how this cause went into this state? We're going to need another substance, right, called E. And, you know, here's the event of this substance going into the state F. And that's going to explain why C went into the state D. And that's going to explain why A went into the state B. Right? And that's like the prosyllogism. Right? Because remember, so the minor premise of the syllogism is going to be C or D, and the conclusion is going to be A or B. The prosyllogism will have the conclusion C is D. And its major premise will be if E is F, then C is D, and so forth. Um, so, um, so we are talking about the same events, but we're talking about them from a different point of view, right? We're not talking about them as all adding up in quantity to get us to this one. We're talking about them as changes in the underlying substances that explain why this one occurred. Um, right, and then the two opposing opinions, the thesis and the antithesis, this is also legal terminology, but I'm not going to, I mean, thesis in Greek, um, among other things, means like legislation. So a thesis and an antithesis are, is like a law and a counter law, basically. But in any case, so the thesis and the antithesis, and I mean, you should notice, if it, well, I mean, you can't notice because you only read one of the antinomies, but if you were to go through the other antinomies, you would notice that the thesis is always, first of all, it's always the one that, um, that wants an absolute start to the series. The antithesis is always the one that wants the series to go on infinitely. Also, the thesis is kind of the good side and the antithesis is the bad side. So like in this case, why is the thesis the good side and the antithesis the bad side. Well, so the the thesis says um, at some point there must be a cause that puts itself into some state without any external explanation. That's what can start this series. Um, that's what Kant called spontaneity.
We put it called spontaneity in this context. Maybe spontaneity sometimes means something else. Um, right? So, like when you read him talking about spontaneity, don't think uh, like kind of happy go lucky spur of the moment or something like that. Right? It's this technical thing. A spontaneous cause is, is a substance that puts itself into a certain state, but there's no there's no explanation. Right, so the thesis says, yes, there's spontaneity. In addition to the usual kind of um, causation in the world, there's another mode of causation, spontaneous causation. Um, and uh, if it weren't for that, we couldn't explain why anything happened. Right, because because this is how the thesis argues. Um, you know, suppose suppose there is no such first thing, then um, um, everything that happens in this series going back is itself unexplained. And so the whole series taken together is unexplained. I mean, how can it be more explained than any of its parts? So, um, so therefore, there, there has to be a spontaneous cause. And Kant also says, But this is the transcendental definition of freedom. Transcendental definition of freedom is that a uh, substance is free if it acts spontaneously. So now, like the thesis and the antithesis are, I mean, what gets us to this in the context of the antinomy is again asking for an explanation of. Or for like a guarantee that every event in the world has a complete external explanation. And in particular, in the third antinomy, that it has a complete explanation like this, that it can be completely explained as an effect. Um, so like um, in that context, the issue is really about divine freedom, right? Like, I mean, although this, like this is a substance in the world. <laughs> so it's not exactly um, um, but it's 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 about like a, a free act that begins the entire series of causes and effects. We only need one. And that's all the thesis argues for, the main part of its argument. Um, and then the antithesis says, well, there isn't even one. Um, I mean, in a sense, it's part of the mistake that that's what they're arguing over. Or anyway, it's part of the, the like weird two-step procedure that I mentioned before, where like, Reason looks for an unconditioned explanation. But then the way it does it is to say, well, take the totality of all the of, of all the conditions. The unconditioned the unconditioned explanation must be in there somewhere. Because there's no conditions outside of it. Right. And so we concentrate on whether it has a first member or, or not. But um, but in any case, that's what they're arguing about. But then in the course of the argument, both the thesis and the antithesis bring up um, the human freedom as a side issue. <laughs> um, so, um, just actual free antinomy.
Yeah, so this is on B477. So by the way, like in the in, in the A and the B edition, the antinomies were printed on the thesis on one page and the antithesis on the basement page. So if you look at the page numbers in the margin, you'll see that. So actually, I shouldn't have said B four seventy seven. It's actually B four seventy six, <laughs> right? But if you look at these page numbers in the margin, you'll see that this column only has even pages, and this column only has odd pages. <laughs> um, so in any case, so this is on B four seventy six, continuing on to B four seventy eight, page four thirteen, in the left column. Um, The necessity of a first beginning. So this is a, the observation on the thesis of the third antinomy. The necessity of a first beginning due to freedom of a series of appearances we have demonstrated only insofar as it is required to make an origin of the world conceivable. For all the later following states can be taken as resulting according to purely natural laws. But since the power of spontaneity, of spontaneously beginning a series in time is thereby proved, though not understood, it is now also permissible for us to admit within the course of the world different series as capable in their causality of beginning of themselves, and so to attribute to their substance the power of acting from freedom. Right, so Kant is saying, you know, that if the thesis side had succeeded in proving its case, then um, true, all it would have proven is one free cause that begins the whole series of empirical events. But once we admit that such a thing is possible, even though we don't understand how it's possible, but I mean, Kant also says on behalf of both the thesis and the antithesis, it's no objection to say we don't understand how it's possible. We don't understand how like Newtonian gravitation is possible. We know it's actual, right? So once it's established that this is possible because it's actual, it's permissible to assume that it's happening in other cases too. So there can be series, you know, there can be other three causes here. And you know, that would mean that a series of effects follows from this, but can't be explained in terms of anything that happened before. Other things did happen before it, right? So that's why this is not the same as the first answer. Um, but, you know, uh, those other things aren't causally relevant because there was a spontaneous cause here. So, um, so that, so the thesis argument basically says, like, or throws in for the observation, well, uh, um, and by the way, since I've proven this, I've also shown that it's permissible to assume human freedom. Right? We can assume if we if we have some reason to that humans are among the substances that act spontaneously. And the reason to would be ethics, right? So that's why, as I said to begin with, the thesis is the good side. <laughs> right? It's but it's still wrong. So, I mean, so like this is, explains why in some places, I think this is a preface actually, or maybe it's in the introduction to the antinomy. Kant says that, like, given that neither side can win this argument, um, uh, people are going to be tempted to, like, kind of um, give the last word to the good side. <laughs> but that's really a mistake. According to Kant, really the good side and the bad side are both wrong, and ethics really doesn't rest on this kind of metaphysical foundation at all, but a, a different, you have to think in a different direction. Um, I was going to say, well, I'll just say without giving the details that on the other hand, the antithesis in the observation says, and by the way, even if this initial freedom were allowed, we couldn't by any means admit that there was freedom appearing in other places in the sea. Right, so it's like the bad side is really bad. 
Um, okay. Um, we'll talk about the solution to the antinomies next time. <laughs> See you then. Oh.